I've been doing a lot of 2024 having videos, but I do think it's worthwhile because the having is less than 30 days away. And a lot of people, even in the Bitcoin community, still question the importance or the effectiveness of the block subsidy cutting in half and eventually turning towards zero, which is quite interesting because I would say 21 million Bitcoin is a pretty core component of why Bitcoin is special as money. And so I have these lists of questions that qualitatively walk through why Bitcoin is affected by the having and why scarcity in Bitcoin actually matters. So the first question is, do miners sell Bitcoin to cover their expenses? The answer is yes. Miners come online when it makes sense to mine Bitcoin at a cheaper price than to buy Bitcoin. Effectively, you're mining Bitcoin at 1,000 and you're selling it at 3,000. Or today you're mining Bitcoin at 30,000 and you're selling it at 70,000. The expenses that you are using to, to mine that Bitcoin for 30,000 are mainly energy expenses. You have to buy these ASICs and you have to plug them in and you have to, you know, pay your electricity bill. And so typically, whether you're a public miner, a private miner, or a small retail miner, you're most likely going to at least be selling the Bitcoin that you're, you're making to pay off your energy bill. Second question is, does the halving cut mining revenue in half? Yes. So at the halving day, the block subsidy, which is newly mined Bitcoin, which makes up a large majority of the entire block reward currently, gets cut in half. That's what full nodes allow. That's what our rules set when you run a full node. And that's just how it works. Yes, transaction fees exist and they play sometimes a, a, a role, but for the most part, a large majority of the miners revenue is currently still the block subsidy. Another question is, do the weakest miners in ASICs turn off? So we're gonna go through this period where the block subsidy gets cut in half and mining revenue takes a big hit. Now, when any business sees their revenue cut in half, what's gonna happen? Likely the weakest players in that industry are gonna get turned off. And when the weakest players in, in the mining industry get turned off, that's gonna be really good for Bitcoin because the weakest, most inefficient players in the mining industry either have very high energy expenses or they have old generation Bitcoin ASICs. In both cases, they have very, very tight margins, probably even before the halving. And so those miners are the miners selling the most Bitcoin. When those miners turn off, the only miners that remain are the miners with the most efficient ASICs and the miners with, or the miners with uh, very low energy expenses. And so you combine those two, those two miners, that, that, those miners have massive margins. They are um, very profitable and those are the only miners remain. So the having purges the weakest miners who are selling the most Bitcoin and only the strongest miners that sell a little Bitcoin are remaining after the having. Another question is, does the marginal seller affect the price of Bitcoin? This should be obvious, but yes, if there are less people selling Bitcoin, then the price will probably go up higher relative to where it is today. Now, does the having then affect the price of Bitcoin? So if you buy into the first few questions that I just asked there, where I provably very clearly show that the weakest, most inefficient miners will get cut off. Therefore, those miners will not be selling Bitcoin. Only the strongest miners will remain. Those miners will be holding more of the Bitcoin. That means there's objectively less selling pressure in the market. And therefore, the halving would affect the price if you believe that sellers affect the price of Bitcoin. Another question is, is there not an immediate effect because a cut in the flow of new coins requ requires time Hence the definition of a flow being a quantity per unit of time. So a lot of people are like, yeah, of course, you know, the, the moment the block comes out that the, the subsidy is cut in half, Bitcoin doesn't go to the moon or go to, you know, a million dollars or whatever you want to say. Well, of course, Bitcoin doesn't go to a million dollars right when the, the, that block hits. That's, 
that's literally only three Bitcoin that's going to make a difference. But if you, but the, the, the block subsidy is not just a point in time. It's a flow. It's like if you have a river and the river all of a sudden has a massive flow, but you look at the, the one second that the river, you know, how much, uh, how much water has flown in the first second from the river into the lake, it's going to be almost nothing. But if you look at that over a year or even a month or three months or six months, the lake starting going to start to get full. And that's what this, the subsidy is. The subsidy is a flow of new coins and you have to look at, you have to look at a flow over time. If you don't look at it over time, then it doesn't make sense. And so that's why nothing happens. The, the moment that the, the having occurs. Another question is if the price begins to rise, is there a delay before new miners come online due to the time required to build mining and inf energy infrastructure? Yes. Um, so when the price, you know, starts to go to 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, even, um, it would become very profitable to mine Bitcoin. However, mining Bitcoin is a lot different from buying Bitcoin. Michael Saylor can go on Coinbase or go use a, a, a OTC desk and say, Hey, I want to buy $1 billion worth of Bitcoin over the next five days. And they'll be like, okay, sure. We can do that. If you wanted to deploy $1 billion worth of capital into the Bitcoin mining industry, that's not something that can happen overnight. You have to find a power producer that has excess load to spare and excess power generation to, to plug your ASICs into. And that takes time. There may not be extra power right now. You may have to build, you know, your own power plant or acquire a power plant. On top of that, you have to build out the infrastructure, right? You have to get the transformers. You have to build out the data center. You have to get all these people involved. You have to order a bunch of ASICs. You have to get those ASICs shipped most likely from, from China to the U S or to wherever in the world that takes time. Then you have to unbox the ASICs. Then you have to plug them all in. Then you have to make sure everything's hooked up the transformers and all the power and still in the data centers built. It doesn't happen in five days. <laughs> that happens in maybe 12 to 18 months, maybe even more, depending on who's, who's setting it up and how in demand it is to set up. There's not, you know, there's not many people that are Bitcoin mining experts that can build infrastructure really fast. And so, yes, like there is a delay before more miners come online. The following question is, so the price can rise, but sell pressure can remain unchanged for 12 to 18 months post having. Yes. Like we're saying, if miners are the key source of sell pressure and miners can't come online relatively quickly, then 12 to 18 months after the halving, when the weakest miners are purged, it takes time for new miners to come online. And so if there are no new miners coming online quickly, then there are no additional sellers in the market. The existing miners that survived the halving, those are the ones that are able to, to, keep operating and, and their margins get larger because their costs remain the same, but the price of Bitcoin is going up. So they can actually sell less Bitcoin over time, same amount of dollars, but less Bitcoin. And, you know, there's not many more miners immediately coming online to take market share and to also sell to cover their expenses. Another question is, this means the price goes up, attracting a new wave of adoption and few natural sellers exist for 12 to 18 months. Again, yes, pretty straightforward. So the having is very bullish for Bitcoin again. Yes, makes sense, but this doesn't matter for Litecoin, ETH and bomb or whatever, another crypto token that you, you want to pick out because there's no real demand for the second best monetary tool because money solves a double coincidence of once by becoming the one most marketable tool. Yes. So yes, of course, Litecoin havings or ETH ultrasound money, you know, negative supply growth. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter to the extent that these things are all derivatives of Bitcoin. They are high beta and high beta, high theta derivatives of Bitcoin, meaning they are, you know, they, if Bitcoin goes down 1%, these things go down 2%. If Bitcoin goes up 1%, these things go up 2%. And they're high theta because over time, 
they just decay back to zero. Like they have one good cycle where the public speculates on them in a very big way, but eventually they all turn to zero against Bitcoin. And the whole point of Bitcoin, like, like we're talking about is it's the one best monetary tool. Economic systems converge on money because money is what we use for trade. If you have apples and I have bananas and we want to exchange, we have to figure out, okay, when do you want apples and when do I want bananas or vice versa? Whereas instead we converge as a system on one tool, the most marketable tool that we know that we can hold, it's durable, it's divisible, it's portable, it's scarce. And then we can hold that money, that tool, and then trade it for whatever we want else, whatever else we want in, in the future. And so there's only, and, and so there's really only a, a point to have one money because that's what money does. It, it helps you converge on one tool for savings and trade. And so all of this talk is really just to, to highlight the having matters and Bitcoin is going up forever. So that's it for today. If you like this video, please subscribe, like, retweet, whichever platform you're on. But uh, thanks for watching everyone and see you next time.